Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. So excited to be here with you. Uh, love seeing all of you and your beautiful faces that I can't really see physically, but I see them. I feel them. They are part of the um, air that I breathe. So welcome to the Katie Helper Show. We have a great show for you coming up. We have a jam-packed show. We got uh, Kate Willett joining us for the first part. Uh, she and I are going to be going over some headlines, some news stories. Then we will be joined by the wonderful Rabia Altabani and Esha Kirshaswamy will be doing a discussion about Saudi Arabia uh, and Biden's visit there. First things first, though, uh, everyone like the stream. It's a great way to get past the corporate uh, censorship, the tech overlords who try to rule the world and uh, suppress the stream. Not to sound too grandiose or anything or self-aggrandizing, but please do like the stream. Uh, if you want, you can share it. Uh, please subscribe by hitting subscribe and then the bell. Uh, if you can, you can, of course, support the show, help make it happen by becoming Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. You can also become YouTube members. Um, and when you do that, it's cool. You get badges that show how long you've been a member for. And you also get little emojis, like little Bodhi emojis that are emojis made out of my little dog. Plus, uh, we're going to start doing some guest emojis, which are really fun. We're making emojis out of, um, or gifts, gifts out of people's faces who are on the show in a nice way, not in an unflattering way, not in a mocking way. So um, let's see. I think we're just going to, we went through all the, what's it called? Housekeeping, house cleaning. I never know which one it is, but we went through that. Uh, sufficiently. So we're going to bring in uh, my first guest, Kate Willett. She's the co-host of the Reply Guys podcast, and uh, she's the author of Dirtbag Anthropology, which is an Audible original. And her 15-minute special premiered on Netflix comedy lineup. So without further ado, welcome, Kate. Hello. How are you? Hello. Good. How are you? Pretty good. Good. Nice to see you. Uh, you're. Are you not, not at home? I am at home. Yeah. I just, uh, I started like podcasting in the room next door to my room because my oh. cats are in the other room and they make a lot of noise. So <laughs> I, I, I'm giving myself some space from them. Wow. I like it. Yeah. It's kind of a uh, Spartan. I know. I need to way. put, some, I, I got to put some books or, or flowers. Just throw or, or a, throw a, like a, yeah, throw a, what are they called? Tapestry. Those are yeah. never good though. They yeah, can be good, but they can be a little like, they're a little fortune reading. Yes. Yeah, sometimes. that's kind of my vibe. I've got that California that is kind of your vibe. thing. I, I yeah. remember when I made you go to nature. <laughs> and you oh, yeah. It. We went. We had a fun time in nature. I liked it. We just weren't prepared. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do I out you as that person who I was with when I shared uh, that's the story? That's okay. I'm, I'm willing to be oh. outed as the, as okay, the yeah. uh, Kate, incompetent nature friends. Yeah. Yeah. No, K Kate and I went. Uh, you may have heard of this on um useful idiots. I shared this story about having an interesting nature adventure where we started out so strong uh, on a river and the current was actually stronger than we were. And we would have been fine had we been wearing life jackets, which everyone must wear. Everyone it's must true. wear life jackets. You got to do it. Really important. Wear a life jacket. Also, uh, keep your shoes on. I got my so that wasn't really your fault, though. But uh, yeah, share, I, share we happened. got out of the, the boat to walk and it was muddy and the, the mud ate one of my shoes. So then I had to walk back without a shoe. Right. Until... At which point we had to change plans a little bit because we were no. See, I never thought we'd be able to walk it all the way back. We basically went on a river and I thought that I should. It's really my fault because I spent a lot of time here. I should have known that you can't go against the current for that long but Kate looked confident and I thought maybe she would just lead us there and I would be like playing backup kind of but it was just too much we couldn't do it I went on a river this weekend or no a, a, a reservoir yeah yeah how was that I had to it was good someone else was doing most of the paddling and he was yeah. strong so yes much stronger than me but there was no current yeah. Except for occasionally another boat left awake, but you know it was a lot, lot yeah. more mellow in terms of the yeah. the paddling. 
Yeah, that was what we were contending with. Kate, can you refresh your Wi-Fi or something here again at the Katie Halper Show? We break down that fourth wall like nobody's business. Can you refresh your um, connection? Because you're glitching a little bit. You're freezing a little bit. Um, unless it's me, but I don't think so because I'm Etherneted in. Am I here now? Yes, you're here now. Okay. Uh, all right, cool. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we got... Uh, so what was the discussion like to get someone drive you back to your car, Katie, after you almost sailed down the channel? It's a good question. And uh, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, the joke's on you because I don't drive. It was Kate's car, which we had left at a friend's house. And uh, it was, I feel like your voice was a little higher than usual, which I did divulge on Useful Idiots. I think I, when I get anxious, I get kind of deadpan and like dour. Which is, I think you're the more typical anxious person when you're anxious. Yeah. Well, also, when we were trying to get the ride, I was like, okay, this guy is, <laughs> he seemed kind of conservative. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, we, we were, we were so almost there. We almost made it. And then we were fr finally figured out we could just float down the river and get to basically from these friends' house to my parents' house, and we would have been fine. But then what happened is the the boat we were in, which was like a, a float, had a hole in it. So then, which is funny because had we only, we had all this unnecessary anxiety between realizing we could have floated. Then we were fine, but then we got the hole. So then we basically spoke to some people who were on the, like the shore drinking beers. They didn't look trashed. Not that we had any choices. I mean, we would have gotten into the car with it strung out very drunk, high on heroin, tweaking person at this point. Because again, we were like at plan D. But um, I tried to keep my voice lower because I don't know why. I was really afraid that like we were going to scare them off. So I think I played calm cop to your anxious cop. Yes, maybe. Probably, yeah. Right? And, uh, but also I did, f so, so we basically told them what happened and we were trying to get them to get us a phone, but they were kind of lazy about not wanting to get their phone, which was weird. Like they had service, which was one part of the battle. Cause a lot of people don't have service. So they did have service, but they didn't have their phones on them. So then we were like, okay, well, sorry, but our boat is literally like sinking. We don't have a lot of choices. So can you please help us with a phone? And at that point they asked us where we where we were going and it was close enough that they just drove us there then kate had to walk across this is like the odyssey but worse you had to walk across some thorny path in one yes, shoe a lot of brush a lot of very dry a lot of brush. brush yeah what i should have done was walked and then thrown you my shoes but we my didn't feet have healed it's all good i came okay. back it's yeah healed. yeah well there was yeah. there was a there was a water shoe but the water shoe got eaten Right. The there mud. was one shoe that you had on. That was right. Which was not yeah. even a water shoe. What I was so impressed about, because I think a water shoe wouldn't have gotten eaten if it had been a real water shoe. It was like, they were like water safe shoes. Not like, they were they like were, shoes put in the water. They were wa definitely waterproof, but they yeah. weren't like, I can go put my foot in the mud and get my foot out with the shoe attached. Ah, uh, yeah. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They yes. were totally waterproof. In fact, I was, they were very sensible looking shoes. They're as sensible as you can look while still looking nice. This was a lot of, there was just a lot of adventure here. A lot yeah. of adventure. <laughs> and I think they were singing, I'm proud to be an American. Yeah, it was a lot. Right? They definitely uh, voted for uh, Donald Trump. Probably, for, yeah. For, Probably, yeah. Yeah. They, they so also... Yeah, I'm going to say they believe the 2020 election was stolen. What's the vibe there? Really? You think that much? Interesting. The, the, there Maybe. was a stop the steal vibe, that. but we stop were out of options. Vibe. Yeah. We were totally out of options. I would have told them that it was totally stolen. I mean, yeah. I would have gone full pizza gate if needed <laughs> just to like, get home. If that guy had been willing to toss me some shoes, yeah, I would have been like Hillary yeah. Clinton, body double, you know. Yeah. For totally, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Vince Foster. Yeah. Yeah. Those bloody hands. Yeah. Um, but that, that was a good time. That was a good time. And, uh, I also went on a, I was on a, a lake this weekend and I, I did some kayaking. I've never done any of this stuff, by the way. Never. Uh, this was the first time. Never you. kayaked. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I did stand up paddle boarding. That sounds very so fun. fun. I've never done that. 
it's so fun. And you stand up and you really have to, first I did it on my knees. I paddled on my knees. Then I got, I stood up, then I fell off, but I got back on again. Not only did I get back on, on my knees, but I then got back on my feet and it's very good exercise. A lot of core work that goes into it. So highly, uh, highly recommend that. Um, and what else is going on with you, Kate? We can talk about the world, the state of politics. Um, Try and think what's going on. Um, you know, I unplugged for like a few days because I just went on this camping trip. And so I feel like I'm not totally caught up on the news. I will like I will be learning about some of the stuff you're showing me for the first time, probably. But it was well, so good, yeah. It was so good to unplug. I it felt good to unplug. All right. She unplugged a little too much. She's showing instead of telling right now. She's showing us what it looks like to unplug. I guess that room is better because it doesn't have cat sounds, but the Wi-Fi may not be as good. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, she's back. All right. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to plug you in. Sorry about because that. You were Oh, that's okay. Kate unplugged. I do like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right I know you said that you were unplugged. It was I perfect. Like it. But no, it was, it was very good to like detach and like be with the trees. You know, I'm a California yeah. girl to do that. You are a California girl. Her, yeah, yeah. I almost got talked into, you know, joining a polycule, abandoning my life in New York, but you know, I'm back. And I'm bitter. monogamy. I am. No, I'm not even monogamous. I'm like, I am disgusted by <laughs> I just meant like you are abandoning monogamy for your polycule, but you're saying you don't even monogamy identify. No, I'm like, I am, uh, <laughs> I am my own wife at this point in the post pro yeah. world. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's too gross. I mean, I think if, you know, if I was w in an existing relationship, I'm sure I wouldn't like dump that person or anything, but it just feels right. very like, Oh man, like all the news is so misogynistic. And then, you know, some I'll be on an app and some dude will send me a picture of his, you know, his stuff, his parts. And I'm like, this is too much. I'm just getting it from all angles here. So I'm kind of yeah, reconvening with my witch nature at this moment. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, well, maybe in a maybe I'll get personal. I, I still I keep my that wall. I don't go fully personal the way you and Brie do, Brianna Joy Gray. But I may have to divulge some things at some point. We'll see. Like, so, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, just, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, you almost caught me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, someone asked if you're gay, Kate. You give off lesbian vibes. I don't know. You don't have to answer that question. I just thought it was an interesting question. I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, I I identify yeah. as bisexual, but sometimes it goes yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. You guys should read Dirtbag uh, Anthropology. Dirtbag Anthropologist, excuse me. No, Anthropology. Every single time I announce the name of your book, your Audible original, I doubt myself. I say it the first time correctly, then I say it incorrectly. It's Dirtbag Anthropology. Yes. Okay, Dirtbag Anthropology, yeah. You should read that. Then you'll find out more about Kate's predilections. <laughs> um, that sounds so pervy, but it's not at all predilections it sounds like a weird has a weird vibe to it anyway well i'm going to share some stories with you that you may have missed okay kate because okay. you're unplugged okay. all right so here's um here's one did you hear the story about how biden had told uh, joe biden told mitch mcconnell he was going to name a federal uh judge uh he was going to name a federal judge who was anti-choice Yes, He's I did hear that. Yeah, okay, yeah. you heard about that. That so was before he's gonna I nominate pre unplug. You heard this. He was going to nominate a conservative anti-abortion attorney as a federal judge in Kentucky. Okay, so that was the news that that was the plan from uh, Biden, and people were like, "I can't believe this." You know, they're overturning Roe, and now Biden's making a deal with Mitch McConnell where he's going to nominate an anti-choicer. Why is he doing this? What on earth could he be getting in return for it? So people probably thought, you know, well, politics are dirty business. Politics is a dirty business, um, but he must be making some deal. He must be getting uh, something out of it, right? Yeah, and it was. Okay, 
Nothing. Well, no. A- according to McConnell himself, Mitch McConnell, he told the New York Times there was no deal uh, with Biden to trade a nomination for other considerations in the chamber and called the president's willingness to nominate his favored conservative judge the kind of collegiality senators used to display. Quote, this was a personal friendship gesture, McConnell added. So just so you know, when Joe Biden names, not offers to nominate an anti-choice conservative, it's not because he wants to get anything from it. Uh, it's because he actually is doing it to be nice. When I have, fir- yeah. first saw the yeah. title of that article, it said like tanking the nomination, but I, I misread it as a... Uh, that uh, McConnell had called, or Rand Paul or McConnell had called Biden a tanky. A tanky and I was like, yeah. oh no, they learned that word. You know, yeah, they could, it, yeah. it wouldn't be that surprising. It wouldn't be that inconceivable because people <laughs> do throw around the word tanky a lot. They throw it around at me. Uh, have you been blessed with that term? No. Oh, wow. Well, I'll, I'm, you're still welcome to be on the show despite that, despite the fact that you haven't been called that. But that brings another interesting point up about this, which is that, okay, so the, the, the nomination didn't go through. So people may think, oh, that's good. So finally, uh, because progressives were so upset, Joe Biden must have rescinded that, right? He must have realized that that was a terrible thing to do. No, this whole thing, this whole deal was tanked by Rand Paul. Okay, if we go to the article, Senator Rand Paul blames McConnell for tanking deal with Biden for anti-abortion federal judge nominee. Basically, Rand Paul had his feelings hurt because he wasn't involved in this deal. It was like behind, he felt like it was behind his back. This is such petty bullshit. It's amazing. So it says um, Rand Paul said, I support Chad Meredith. That's the judge and support the lawyer who's going to be a judge. Uh, I support Chad Meredith. And sorry, I'm about to sneeze. One second. Sorry, we're going to have to cut this out in the edit. Ah! One second. Sorry about that. I support... um, I support Chad Meredith and supported him when he was considered for a different position. I think he would make a good judge, Paul told USA Today in a written statement. Unfortunately, instead of communicating... Uh, and lining up support for him, Senator McConnell chose to cut a secret deal with the White House that fell apart. McConnell's to blame for tanking this because he tried to do it secretly, which is, thank God. I mean, thank God that he's such a petty little bitch because uh, now we don't have a, a terrible guy who's been nominated to be a judge. Thank God for small favors, like Rand Paul's major insecurity. I wonder what kind of weird abandonment issues he has. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's he, he's a libertarian, right? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. his thing. Yeah. I have so many thoughts on libertarian stuff right now that aren't really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I thought that that was pathetic. It's so pathetic because it's like every time you think Biden couldn't get any worse, he's even worse than that. I know. And then he always announces that he's going to consider being better. It's like having a bad boyfriend where they're like, I'm going to try, you know, and like, but like today he's like, I'm thinking about announcing a climate emergency. And they're like, no, right. I'm like, why do you come out and say that you're going to try? Like, you know, yeah, it's just, just he's stringing us along. I know he's, he's just not that into us. I think he's just not that into us. Yeah. He doesn't even call it. I mean, he doesn't even, Yeah. This is would be a very ugly love triangle between us, Biden, McConnell, Rand Paul. Talk about a polycule. It's a nice callback. So, okay. Speaking of, I'm going to tie this together. A lot of different threads right now. And it's something seemingly unrelated, I guess. I did learn on this trip. I am, I am friends, very good friends with one libertarian. He was like an anarchist. He's like an, an, mm. an anarchist that leans libertarian. And he was telling me all about how the libertarians, I'm just going to finish a sentence for her, how libertarians were, I wonder what they were, uh, were in suspense. 
Ah, okay. So he was telling me that libertarians are all getting behind a podcaster for their president, the presidential candidate, and that the libertarian party at this point, the party, it, like basically everyone who goes to the convention, it's all like podcast fans now. Like they're wow. starting like a full cabal movement based on podcasters and libertarians. And that was what my friend told me when I went camping with him, my friend who's a libertarian, who's an anarchist with libertarian tendencies. He also told me he's a Virgo and likes long walks on the beach. And um, is thinking about dyeing his hair purple. How did I get it? Good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that was good. All right. Awesome. Mm -hmm. This is a fun game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, he is. I don't know. That's I. My heart almost goes out to Rand Paul. But thank God for his emotional. Thank God for how, how triggered he was, because really we just saved ourselves. A, uh, I think we prevented a really bad judge from, really bad lawyer from becoming a judge. I am very happy that that man was not nominated. He seemed absolutely horrible. Yeah, he really did, which makes Joe Biden absolutely horrible for as a gesture of friendship. Why doesn't he buy McConnell some nice cufflinks? Like Delaware State cufflinks or something. They could shroom together, you know? Yeah. Just like they could shroom together, go on a boat. Yeah, Whatever. true. Yeah. They would fit right Get in lost with those together. Trump guys that, that picked us up. You know? Oh my God. They would, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. bipartisanship right there. That is, yeah. So uh that, yeah. Well that I wanted to make sure you knew about that. So it's like it's worse than you can believe because Biden wasn't even getting anything for it. And then he didn't even like cancel the nomination himself. It was just because of Rand Paul and Mitch McConnell and their weird high school drama. Straight um, up cucked. Straight up cucked. Big time cucked. Uh, something else you may have missed in the news. Uh, very exciting news. Uh, I don't know if you know who uh, Tina Chen is, but the Obama Foundation has tapped Tina Chen, who previously mm. led Time's Up uh, now and the Time's Up Foundation as its new executive vice president and chief strategy and impact officer. Yay, Tina Chen. Now, uh, why is that newsworthy? Besides the fact that, you know, of course, the news of the Obama Foundation is very exciting for everyone. Well, you may recognize Tina Chen's name. She was the CEO of Time's Up. Um, and she, uh, last year, she had to resign from her position uh, at the Anti-Harassment and Women's Advocacy Organization, I'm reading from Forbes, the move comes amid a torrent of criticism over Time's Up's handling of the sexual harassment allegations against former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, specifically criticism that the group was more aligned with the alleged harasser than the women with credible accusations against him. So, uh, hey, you know, when God closes a door for women who enable uh, Me Too predators, he uh, opens a window at the Obama Foundation. I love it. Yeah. It's, can't make it up. Failing yeah. up. Yeah. I saw up. Lindsay Boylan tweeted about this today. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, from what I understand, Time's Up was involved in like several of these instances, right? Of actually trying to suppress yes. the, uh, you know, suppress allegations from coming out publicly or sm smearing victims. And I, I, yeah. I, I I'm not 100% sure, but. It feels like I've heard well, this Tara before. Reed, they Tara said that, Reed, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they they didn't reveal that. You know, um, Anita Dunn was who's a bit big at Times Up was of course part of uh, Biden's campaign, so there's a major conflict of interest there. Um, as Lindsey Boylan, who was accused um, uh, Cuomo of harassment, uh, she she reminds us that this is from a Washington Post article. The text message shows, and this all came out during the investigation into Cuomo for her, his harassment. So this investigation done by um, Letitia James, attorney general, uh, New York state attorney general revealed that uh, text messages show that Time's Up chief executive Tina Chen told her colleagues to quote unquote, stand down from a plan, from a plan to release a public statement supporting Cuomo's first accuser, Lindsay Boylan, after two people connected to the group spoke with Melissa DeRosa. And that's someone who's at, um, who worked for Cuomo. They also, um, Tina Chen also edited and looked at a, an op-ed that they were going to write that was going to smear Lindsay Boylan. 
Uh, something really cool is that someone uh, who worked with Cuomo actually said that they were going to take a page from the Tara Reid book. They were going to victim shame. Literally, they said, we're going to victim shame. They said, look at what Joe Biden did with, with Tara Reid when he was accused. And we're just going to do that with Cuomo. So, um, yeah, that's great. Thank you to Obama. Thank you to Michelle Obama. And thank you to uh, uh, Tina Chen for making this all happen. And yes, as Asha points out, Anita Dunn was a lawyer for Harvey Weinstein. Right. Another thing. It all comes full circle. It's all a beautiful game of um, hide the hide the pervert. Hide the pervert. Promote the perv enabler. Yeah. I mean, being a perv enabler gets you very far. You see it all the time in comedy. And I'm not going to name names here. But, you know, right. being somebody who kind of just goes along with the the pervs yeah. is a great career move you know it is a great career move. yeah you, re you you definitely suffer if you don't do it you know i, I try not yeah. to perv enable but you know there's a lot of pervs all the time everywhere right it's hard yeah it's like you throw a rock you hit a perv yeah luckily well unluckily you don't hit them in the dick usually you know you don't what them in the dick sorry when you throw the rock you don't hit the perv in a dick in the day. Oh, yeah. unluckily, like, right? Yeah. If I was rock, going to throw a rock at a perm, not that in the is day. Where I would aim. Yes. Right. You'd want it to land. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can, maybe we can make something like a sling, a perv slingshot. Oh, it's like when we played bocce ball. We played bocce ball. We did. Ball. That's another we thing we could, did. We played bocce ball. Yeah. We could just throw bocce balls at the perps. Yeah. At the perps. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're not, at, this is all metaphorical bocce balls, nothing weighted or anything. This is a, you know, we're pantomiming this. We're not encouraging yeah. violence, not, not officially yeah. encouraging violence. Yeah. Um, and then one other story I wanted to share with you before we uh, got into our Saudi Arabia discussion with our two amazing guests. Oh, by the way, announcement, Brad, did we put in the, the description, the call in link? No. Okay. I'm going to, can I, can I text that to you? All right. So we're going to do a call in after this. Remember Matthew Ho, uh, who we had on last week, he talks about running as a green and how the Dems sabotaged him. We're doing another call in and, uh, make sure you come to that call in. It's going to be at eight 30. Uh, we're going to put the, the link to that call in, uh, in the description, but it's always a great time. And, um, Brad, actually it's my, my pin tweet, uh, announces this, this stream and then if you click on it right below it's like a follow-up tweet and that has the the call and link to it so all right let's do our the last thing we're going to look at um and brad or tyler one of you can add that because brad has to now play a video we're just going to take a quick look at of at uh fox news basically blaming uh criticism of guess what they're going to blame anti-semitism on and guess what? What do they like to blame anti-Semitism on? Kate is frozen in suspense. I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, criticism of Israel. So here we go. Let's play this clip from Fox News. And the person they're speaking to is Dove um, Heikend, uh, who's a lovely, lovely guy. He's a former Democratic New York State Assemblyman. His greatest hits include opposing same-sex marriage because, quote, if we authorize gay marriage in the state of New York, those who want to live and love incestuously will be five steps closer to achieving their goals as well. It's kind of oddly specific, five steps closer. Uh, he also dressed up in blackface for Purim. Uh, he sued AOC for blocking him on Twitter. Major cuck move. And he supports profiling of Muslims and Middle Eastern and South Asian men because he considers that not racial profiling, but terrorist profiling. He's also was in this really actually, and this is a good reminder of how terrible Wikipedia is because I realized they didn't include this, but he is in like, uh, he's very, uh, hold on, Dove Heikend. What did he do with Palestinians? He, hold on. He was in some extremist group with like Kahani. Let's see. Um, uh, he is a pro-Israel activist in the 1980s. He was a member of the Jewish Defense League, uh, which is basically a far-right uh, religious political like uh, theocratic organization. Um, it's been classified as a right-wing terrorist group by the FBI since 2001. So he is himself a terrorist or a terrorist sympathizer. I don't think he ever picked up any, any arms. Um, more out of cowardice than principle. 
Uh, and he was a follower of Mayor Kahani, who was a very, very uh, racist nationalist uh, Knesset member uh, who was all himself convicted of acts of terrorism. Uh, so that's Doug uh, Dove Hyken. So let's hear what he had to say about anti-Semitic uh, attacks across the U.S. reaching yeah. record highs last year. Look at these numbers. According to the Anti-Defamation League, there were more than 2,700 anti-Semitic incidents across the country last year, 88 of which were physical assaults. And it seems like the rise in anti-Semitic attacks has coincided with the rise in the squad and their anti-Israel rhetoric. Take a listen. Oh, no. Palestinians aren't going anywhere, no matter how much money you send to Israel's apartheid government. This is not a civil war. It is a conflict where one country, funded and supported by the United States government, continues an illegal military occupation. We are bearing witness to egregious human rights violations. This is not about both sides. This is about an imbalance of power. Dove, is that a coincidence or something more? No, it's not a coincidence. AOC, Tlaib, Omar, Surprise. Corey Bush. Tlaib, Tlaib. And the rest of that radical so-called progressive group, they have contributed towards the unprecedented hate, physical assaults upon the Jewish people. What is going on in this country, let's get this very, very clear. This has never happened in the history of this country. The numbers do not lie. And let me tell you the fascinating thing, a report that we're coming out with next week. This is the real story. You can beat up on Jews. You can attack Jews. And nothing will happen to you, the anti-Semite. There are no consequences for hate, for attacking the Jewish people. It is a sad commentary. And I wish to God the president of the United States would address that issue. He hasn't said very much about that. You attack Jews, nothing happens. No penalties. You don't end up in jail, no repercussions. That is a fact. We are going to show those details in a report that we're releasing next week. Yeah, I, I completely understand your anger over this at a time when we hear focus so much. Meanwhile, the guy is literally part of a terrorist organization and is an elected official. So it's really cynical. You're allowed I mean, to get away with that shit. Yeah. Even the stuff that they played, I mean, I'm trying to think of like how this looks to, you know, just a, the the average viewer, but I it, it didn't to me it it just sounded like they were I mean, they weren't saying anything anti-Semitic. Of course at all. they weren't. No, they were yeah. just criticizing Israel in a totally yeah. like policy-based way. way. There was nothing. Yeah. yeah. Like I mean, it's just a disgusting, cynical weaponization of anti-Semitism to hide behind it and to, to try to clobber anyone who's at all justifiably critical of Israel, which, again, it's an apartheid state. You know who says it's an apartheid state besides Amnesty International, which, of course, assholes like Dove claim are anti-Semites, but uh, B'Tselem, the like leading uh, Israeli human rights organization that deals with the occupation. Sorry, I guess they're all self-loathing Jews, according to Dove Heikend. Um, But yeah, let's just let's finish the rest of that that clip. Is it still equity? You don't really hear a lot about the um, attacks against the Jewish community, and that is a that is a really big problem. You don't hear about them. I think you hear about them all the time. It's also just like. These people don't care about bigotry whatsoever, right? Except yeah. for very cynical lines. I mean, they yeah. are. This guy was a Trump endorser too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he, uh, he, he's a Trump fan. This guy. How many he's, people, yeah. like, how many people that are not doing this kind of stuff for you know for purely cynical ends? Do you think buy into this? this line of argument that like it's That's a good question. to criticize Israel I think that there are some, some yeah yeah I think that there are some people who actually buy into that but I think I don't think Hyken does I don't think so either I yeah. mean yeah and then some of these Fox people like they don't know Jews so they're just idiots like I don't think that that blonde woman I don't know how many Jews she knows she looks like she she doesn't really I get some like strong I had never met a Jew that I realize energy from her 
I don't know. She's she's she doesn't strike me as particularly astute, though. Anyway, well, um, Kate, thank you so much for joining me for this, and um, would love to have you back. Uh, we're gonna take a uh, a little musical interval where we just play that little that cute little um, video and with the nice audio, which is Joe Biden saying. Come on, calm down, man, which Brad made. Brad did the audio for that. Catherine Chester made the the uh, actual swish, whatever the technical term is. We're going to play one of those, and then we'll be joined by our two guests, um, Rabia Altabani and Esha Kirshaswamy. So, Kate, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Kate Willett with two T's, or you can find me on my podcast, Reply Guys. Katie has come on several times. We usually have amazing um, women, leftists, feminists. Come on and, uh, yeah, check it out. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye. So, Brad, you're going to play us out. Bye, Kate. You're going to have a little that little song and dance that we do. Oh, before you do that, thank you, Cloud Billow for that super sticker. Oh, and I'm sorry, Brian Frederick, you had a super sticker, which uh, here it is. All Democrats in the House support expanding NATO. That is true, and that's not good. So shame on them. Hashtag not that much of a surprise, but it's still bad. Um, so, okay, let's take a, let's go to the musical break, and then we'll bring in our two guests. Okay, I'm down. And we are back. How do you like that musical break? We are back. We're going to about to bring in two great guests. We are bringing into the stream um, Esha Kershaswamy, who is the host of the Historically podcast. She also has written for FAIR, critiquing corporate media's coverage of international events. And Rabi Altabani, uh, Rabi Altabani, a Yemeni American community organizer with over 15 years of experience organizing voters, advising issue based campaigns, and working at socially committed nonprofits. She is the founder of Arab America, Arab Women's Voice, the first 100% women and minority owned political consulting firm in New York City. And she founded the Yemeni American Coalition for Change to support grassroots movements in the Middle East during the Arab Spring. And she helped organize pressure campaigns, including the Yemeni bodega strike to protest the travel ban, ban and New York Post boycott to protest their attack on Rep. Ilhan Omar. So let's bring on Rabia and Esha. Welcome. Oh, well, nice to be here, but you forgot. Um, I also now write for the Gray Zone, and my first article came out about two months ago. Congratulations. Well, okay, Esha also writes at the Gray Zone. I did ask Esha for her preferred bio, and she gave me one at the Gray Zone, which didn't mention that she was at the Gray Zone. So. <laughs> Sorry. Next time to say mention the gray zone. No, oh, no, no, fine. no. I didn't forget that. I, I don't have a preferred. I don't have a bio. That's the one that looks where the picture looks mildly decent. Oh no, I just meant the bio. I like to the more fourth wall stuff. I like to ask guests for their preferred bios because sometimes people will updates and stuff like that. Anyway, well, I, yeah, I, I thank rather, you for coming. You thank you, and I'd rather not do bios. I get creeped out by them. Oh, okay. Next time I'll just say Esha gets creeped yeah, out just... by bios and we prefer not to do them. But um, <laughs> welcome back, Esha. Welcome, Rabia. You've been on my podcast, but you've never been on my live stream. So uh, make sure, by the way, Rabia, uh, you press voice memo. Are you pressing record on your voice yes, memo? Yes, And cool. long time no Great. see. I think we were at the Bernie rally together, but. I'm pretty sure I've been in many things with you, Esha. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, but I haven't yeah. seen you in a long time. I know, it's been a while. I mean, with COVID and all of that. That's yeah, sure. we should catch up soon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's, please tell us, uh, let's start with you, Rabia, talking about this. Um, it's especially close to home uh, for you uh, as a Yemeni American. Tell us what just happened in Saudi Arabia, what Biden did, what he got out of it, why he went there, your thoughts. Well, I mean, I mean, Biden went to Saudi Arabia mainly because he wants the OPEC countries to produce more oil. That's for sure. However, the Yemeni file, or al-Malaf al-Yemeni, as we say in Arabic, is probably one of their biggest concerns because it is a boarding country, and there, there's been an eight-year war, as we all know, uh, between the Houthis and, uh, and the uh, recognized government of Hadi, internationally recognized government of Hadi. 
which is no longer Hadi because there's a new governmental council that's been formed and Hadi has, is now gone. So Biden um, went to Saudi Arabia because a year and a half ago, I think was a big blunder for him to try uh, to, 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 to uh, what, what, what did he call uh, Saudi Arabia? Uh, a pariah Saudi state. And now we yeah. need to isolate them um, right after, I think it was the Khashoggi murder. Um, and this, obviously offended uh, the Saudis. Um, however, I, for me, I think that uh, what came out of his latest visit um, is, is in many ways, and I'm thinking about Yemen and the war in Yemen, positive. Um, we, right before he, he traveled to the region, there was already a three month truce um, that the Saudis had brokered. The Saudis ha have uh, been negotiating with the Houthis um, in Muscat, Oman, in Jordan for almost a year and a half um, because the Saudis realized after eight years of war that there is no military solution to this conflict whatsoever. Um, uh, I came out against uh, any external intervention in the war in Yemen uh, from the very beginning, not because I'm a Houthi uh, supporter, uh, but because um, I knew and everyone knows that there's no way you can win a military uh, war, uh, especially in the north of Yemen. Um, and that's that's what's been happening. So Saudis realized the Emiratis had left the UAE three years ago, almost almost four years ago since the Hadeda port. They know that there's no way uh, of winning this battle. The Saudis know there's no way of winning this battle. And the solution has to be a political solution. Um, and so Biden um, announced about two or three days ago, was it three days? the same day, I believe, um, or probably the next day, that the Saudis are actually working uh, with the Houthis and the other conflicting parties or um, that are part of this conflict uh, to, to, for a two-year truce. Um, we've had eight years of war. There's no way they're going to um, come up with any kind of real solution or anything close to a real solution in three months. They need time. This, this uh, conflict uh, has been dragging on for way too long. There is a fatigue on all sides, uh, not just the party sides, but particularly on, from all Yemenis, north and south. They want an end to this conflict. They want a solution. Um, and the idea is that the, that some sort of solution or, or some sort of government uh, um, can be um, created in which the Houthis are a part of it because the Houthis at the end of the day are Yemenis. Um, and uh, although they are militia, <laughs> and I was totally against, uh, you know, the way that they um, came about in terms of taking over uh, the government, but um, there is hope now. I feel there is hope. I mean, I, I, uh, Katie, I host these spaces every day on Twitter with hundreds of uh, Yemenis uh, in the region here from from like mortal enemies from all sides that are like literally talking and 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 talking to each other and i feel that there there is um that there is an uh, they they all want some sort of solution they all there is fatigue they are after eight years they're kind of excited at the same time there is distrust there's, there's a lot to it however when they announced that there was a two-year uh solution that the saudis have been um pushing uh, for and that the Houthis, who I talk to every day, are um, saying they're open to it. We're hoping they're open to it. Um, and so that's, I think, for me, as someone that's very much involved in what's happening in uh, the conflict in Yemen, this is probably one of the biggest um, positives that came out of uh, Biden's visit to uh, to the kingdom. Although I know I know the title of today's show is like, what is it? Uh, fist punch? What, what is it? What fist is it? bump. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Actually, uh, Biden can't really shake people's hands. So there was an agreement prior to that <laughs> that, that, <laughs> she's laughing, that that he actually did that with uh, some uh, King America and Prince Salman. But he he also, if you watch the other videos, he fist bumped everybody that was, <laughs> you know, whether they were Saudis or not. So regardless of what I think, uh, at the end of the day, we are facing this conflict, and I don't. I know we all probably come from uh, very different point of views. What's happening with Ukraine and Russia and Putin and all that, and the U.S. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of an election season. Uh, the Americans are <laughs> going to come out and vote against Democrats because they care about how much they're paying at the gas pump. So we we gotta think strategically as Democrats if we really don't want to lose both the House and the Senate. Um, and I think uh, it was a much needed visit and I'm glad that he, he, he went out there. Okay. What's, all right. Thank you. Esha, what say ye? 
Okay, what CI is that I've been reading the Council of Foreign Relations papers about Saudi Arabia and Yemen for like years. And um, what the first thing we have to realize is that there's a story about the scorpion and the frog, frog. where the frog says, you're going to bite me. Um, so we, we can't like, you can't fault people for not wanting to make a deal with the scorpion. But what we do know is that in September of 2019, a Houthi drone and missile attack in Abqaiq and Quraysh oil facilities temporarily cut off 50% of Saudi Arabia's oil production capability. So the reason why Saudi Arabia, after all this time, is finally kind of half-heartedly willing to come to the negotiating table is because now the Houthis can actually have drones that go and hit their oil production facility. As for Biden, um, the U.S. has always uh, uh, thought of um, Saudi Arabia like a tap that they can control for the oil price. So when the U.S. wants it, they turn it on and the oil goes whoosh. And then when they want it, they turn it off. And so um, back in February, when the war with Ukraine started, apparently Biden tried calling MBS and MBS more or less gave him the diplomatic finger. He wouldn't even pick up his phone call. So now um, what Biden could do is take a leaf out of Nixon's book and say, hey, we are setting good prices on all consumer goods, which Nixon did twice. But he no. He wants to go and according to the very racist way the Council of Foreign Relations put it, um, he would uh, um, basically he wanted uh, 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 Joe Biden's request that Saudi Arabia play its traditional role of releasing more oil into the market to tamp down prices. So instead of just setting the price for you, and that means the oil companies will have to take some loss. Oh, oh no, he wants to just open the spigot and let the market decide. But Saudi Arabia is not really interested in this. And we know that because MBS has been talking to China about buying oil in yuans. And, um, and so, uh, but unfortunately, while this, they've had a two month truce, they're still not lifting the blockade. So a lot of food can't come into the main part of Yemen, which is the northern area, which the Saudis are blockading with U.S. aircraft and a lot of U.S. help. So, Isha, you know I'm from the north, right? And my yeah. parents are currently, um, there's, food is in the north. The problem is there's, the Houthis have, and this is an honest, and by the way, the, I'm I'm supposedly part of the Houthi family because I'm from the north and I'm Zaydi and you know how that works, right? Uh, the Houthis yeah. take a lot. Can you explain of the, that how that works? I don't. So, you know, I don't. So, right. So Houthis are Yemenis. They're from a region the north north of Yemen, which is Sada, um, and uh, they are uh, part of the Zaydi sort of Hashemite uh, kingdom that rules. Hashemite Yemen. means they're related to the king of Jordan, basically. Yeah, well, the Hashemites uh, ruled Yemen for over a thousand years. They're the minority because they believe that they have the God-given right. They're supremacists. They're literally the supremacists of Yemen, right? I don't believe in that ideology. No, no, no. I thought they believed that they were uh, direct the descendants of the prophet. I, I'm sorry, without with all due respect. The, uh, the, the, not the Hashemites, uh, uh, not all Hashemites, by the way. I'm talking about the Houthis and their ideology and why. They feel that they have the right to rule over uh, Yemenis at this point. And it is literally them saying that we have the God-given right. Muhammad, our direct descendant, we're the direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, has uh, given us the wilaya, which is that the right to rule over Yemenis, whether they like it or not. It is a purely supremacist ideology. It is wrong in a lot of Hashemites that are not, that don't adhere to that ideology are also against them. Um, that is just a fact, Isha. Um, they are militias. 
what okay. happened to the Houthis and why they became so powerful, and they were able to come and uh, fill up this vacuum, this power vacuum um, in 2014, is that for prior to that, for almost a decade, uh, the president at the time, Ali Abdullah Saleh, waged six wars against them that we all were against, that they were... Uh, they, 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 they were um, un, un uh, how do you say, oppressive wars. They were uh, supported by the Saudis. Uh, and, and Ali Abdullah Saleh was part of their family. He was his baby as well. Because of, he was at the entire time talking about how, you know, uh, the Houthis want to come out and uh, take over Yemen and they want to take us, you know, get rid of the republic that was formed in 1967. For the first time ever, when the Yemeni population stood up against the Imam and his rule. So there is a long history. The majority of Yemenis are not Houthis. The majority of Yemenis are anti-militia. They want a republic. They want a democratic process. But the Houthis feel like it is a God-given right. What I've been hearing from many within the Houthi movement, the more moderate voices, is that they, they also want a solution to this conflict. There is fatigue on their side. They can't hold up for too long. I don't care if they have a thousand Scud missiles that it's just talking about that's going to reach uh, Saudi Arabia or whatever it is. They also see that there's got to be some sort of solution. They can't. They, uh, before all this started, they were part of the um, transitional government. There was negotiations on how to include them to be part of this government because they are, at the end of the day, part they are Yemenis and they need representation, right? So um, that's just a little, very, very short su summary of like the Houthi movement. But it, it, it doesn't m matter. I was just saying that because um, they that are matter. capable of that destroying matters. oil production is why Saudis are, do you disagree with that? Or do you think Saudis no, no, are coming of, to- well, I'm sorry, you should say that again? I said, because the Houthis are capable of destroying Saudi's oil uh, production oh, no is why Saudis are, I was making no moral judgment. No, no, I, I, I agree with you. Actually, okay. fact, three months ago, wait, wait, uh, yeah. Three months ago, in fact, there was a couple of, uh, I think, uh, like you said, drone missiles that even hit Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Yep. So there are definitely, of course, that fear from the UAE, who is now for the past 15, 20 years, by the way, they haven't been a part of this conflict for the last three to four years because they know that there's no military solution. They know they're losing at the end of the day. Um, and they have this, you know, they're, they're developing, they're trying to lure tourists, and Dubai is like the hub of tourism right now. So it's definitely hurting. Of course it is. Economically, it's hurting them um, in every way. The Saudis, the MBS or the uh, uh, Al-Malik Salman or Al-Amir Salman, the prince, um, has uh, laid out a vision for Saudi Arabia uh, and it's called the 2030. For, by, by 2030, he wants to develop the country. He wants to move the country towards more of a model like the, 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 the UAE has been doing in the past 15 to 20 years. And that is not to depend so much on their oil or even the pilgrimage because another 30, 40 years, the Saudis know they're not going to have oil anymore and they have to figure out, they have to diversify their economy. The problem with the Saudis is that they were the biggest funders of the Islamic awakening that began with the Ayatollah Khomeini revolution in Iran in 1979. And then within a couple of years, oops, sorry, there goes my But recording. he is That's, a Shia, so I, I, I would, would kind of... Hold on, let me, wait, let me, let me just, hold on, let, let Rabia just finish He's Shia, though. He's, Shia, they, they have I, not funded... I promise you, I'll get to it. Let me just talk about this very important point that a lot okay. on the left don't have enough information about, is that our biggest problem in the Middle East today is, is the Islamic... Uh, Islamist, the uh, extremism both on the Shia side and the Sunni side. This has become a catastrophe for the region. I mean, we have ISIS at this point. How bad could it get? So in 1979, the Khomeini revolution starts, and then the Saudis and all these Gulf countries, the UAE, uh, uh, went on a race, like a, a competition. Who's going to become, how are, they, how are we going to counter this uh, Shia, you know, Islamic revolution? Well, we're going to have our own awakening, Islamic awakening. And it literally destroyed the entire region. We have been suffering for more than 30, 40, four decades under this plague that has taken us back uh, decades. And so uh, right now, I mean, the, the Emiratis have been, you know, have been funders of these terrorist organizations, of madrasas all over the Arab Muslim world, of, you know, of these imams and sheikhs that are like, have literally destroyed the lives of women and girls in every home and across uh, the Arab Muslim world. 
are now, they've been doing it for the past 15 years, are like fighting back against extremism, and I commend them for that. But what I commend, and you can ask any Arab, whether they're Shia or, or, or Sunni, whether they're in Lebanon, Iraq, or Yemen, or anywhere in the Arab Muslim world, what they think of what the MBS is doing at this point, and that is his fight against Islamists, uh, 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 whether it's in Saudi Arabia or all across the region. And so there, there is something to be said about this. I mean, I came out very, and I still am, especially when it comes to the war in Yemen, anti-MBS. Of course I was anti-Saudi. Of course I was. Okay. Can I please um, make my point? Because you seem to be conflating both, like Shias and Sunnis, and they're not equivalent, of course, because the literacy rate in Iran before the revolution was around 32%, and the literacy rate in Iran after the revolution is almost at a hundred percent. So bye. So if you guys are watching this live, you are so unlocked because this a lot of this is going to be Patreons. Uh, we're going to have some of this up for everyone. Uh, but uh, uh, you guys are here. You saw it here first. You get to see all of it. If you're watching this later and you want to see the whole thing, or at least most of it, because some of it may have to be edited out because it'll probably be unintelligible, then please go to patreoncom slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreoncom slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Please like the stream. Please um, uh, share these streams. Please subscribe. All of that stuff helps with the um, with the uh, algorithm. Okay, so again, thank you, Esha Kirshaswamy. Thank you, um, Rabia Altabani. And thank you, Brad and Tyler. And thank you, Phantom is Fanta. And thank you, everyone. And uh, if you missed this live, definitely go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And thank you, Kate Willett. Okay, bye, everyone.